Good morning and welcome to St. Mary of the Angels. It is the third Sunday in Easter and we are going to worship this morning. However, our worship's going to be a little bit different. Obviously, it has been different for the, for the past uh, few weeks now. It's going to continue to be a little bit different. One of the things that has taken place during this time away is we've begun moving forward with some of the work that we've actually needed on our campus, on our physical property. As you might be able to tell, we have new roofs that have come on. Uh, you might be able to hear right now the pressure washing team that is cleaning the front side of the building. Um, it's, it's actually been a real challenge for us to figure out how to shoot videos with the to, to get worship into your homes with the roofers banging away and the cleaning staff and all the things taking place but i think when it's all done you'll be able to come back to this place and you'll be able to see that in this time a transformation has taken place that things have changed and even though they're different than what they were it might not be all that bad in fact it might be better there go the pressure washers again. So with that, I'd like to thank you for joining us this morning and welcome you to worship with St. Mary of the Angels. And we'll begin our service with this. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia.
Before we get into our worship this morning, I want to unpack a little bit about what it is we do and why. Our service is broken into two parts. The first part is the liturgy of the word. The second part is the liturgy of the table. The liturgy of the table is when we come together for communion. Unfortunately, right now, we haven't been able to do that. Don't worry, one day again, we will. But in the meantime, we've been focusing a lot on the liturgy of the word. So I wanna tell you a little bit about that. We use a tool called the Revised Common Lectionary. Some of us call it the RCL. And what it does is it breaks up the scriptures, the Bible, into a whole bunch of different readings. Usually an Old Testament, a Psalm, a New Testament, and a Gospel. On occasion, you'll have a situation like we're going to have this morning, where it's actually a New Testament reading, a Psalm, a New Testament, and a Gospel. So really that's three New Testament readings and one Old Testament, but it doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is a lot of people don't understand why it is that we read the different scriptures we read. And the reasoning is, is because the Bible tells one big story. It's called a meta narrative, a, a large story from beginning to end. And it's important that we focus on all parts of it because they all point to the same cross. With that being said, I want to invite you this morning as we go through the readings of today, and I ask that you look for maybe a theme that might go from one to the next. So first, we're gonna start with our opening reading from the book of Acts. Good morning. This is a reading from the book of Acts. Peter, standing with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. The word of the Lord. In that first reading from the book of Acts, Peter has a change. Peter is able to, with confidence and authority, stand up in front of a large crowd and start speaking. And it's not just that he's speaking with confidence, but that he's actually speaking truth. Now, if you've read through the scripture, the gospel, you know that Peter often has a time of putting his foot in his mouth. He speaks before he thinks. Well, at this particular moment, he spoke of something with such truth that people were changed, that Peter was changed, and that those people around him recognized a need for something different, a different perspective in their lives as they came together and accepted what it was God has to offer them. I think if you listen, you might hear something similar to that in our next reading, which is from the Psalm. Today, we reflect on portions of Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. The cords of death entangled me, the grip of the grave took hold of me, I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray you, save my life. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. So in our psalm, we kind of continued that theme of a change being needed in our lives. And in the psalm, the psalmist is talking about how death has a grip on me. But when I called to the Lord, something changed, something was different. 
And what can I do? How can I possibly repay? What steps can I take in my life now because of that change that has taken place? We're about to go into our third reading from 1 Peter. And listen to these words and see if you can carry this theme that we've been talking about through to this next reading. A reading from 1 Peter. If you invoke his Father, the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from your heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. The word of the Lord. In our lesson we just heard from 1 Peter, we find that maybe our perception of this world, the perspective we have, could be a little bit challenged. Uh, we hear about the value of gold or silver, but how that value is nowhere near the value of what Christ has offered us in our lives. The change that he can take and place in our lives. The last reading we do in the Liturgy of the Word is our Gospel. We do a reading of it typically out amongst the people where we carry the book up high as if to show honor and value to the book. Imagine this. Imagine you're at a sporting event and in the last moment of the game somebody has a play that is so brilliant that the team comes back and wins the game. The team might then pick that person up over their shoulders and hold them high in a place of honor and celebration. That's why we hold the gospel up when we walk out amongst the people. So I'm going to proclaim the gospel for you today. I'm going to read our lesson. It's from the lesson of Luke. And then after that, we actually have a message coming from our bishop, Bishop Greg Brewer. And he's going to talk about some of this perspective change that we might find in our lives and the hope that can come from that. But before then, this is the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Now on that same day, two of Jesus' disciples we're going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked him, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. 
When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of our Lord.
Welcome to the chapel of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Florida. I'd like to begin this morning with the collect for the third Sunday of Easter, which we are commemorating today. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of the bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This morning we are invited to walk with the two who were making their way home to Emmaus from Jerusalem. When we enter into the scene according to the Gospel of Luke, the two are walking together and in the anonymity of a country road are talking freely. In some ways, the language we would use is they are processing their grief. The one that they hoped would literally turn everything around. The one who had already changed their lives profoundly, even irrevocably, was gone. And at that point, there was no hope of any resurrection, at least not that they could remember. Grief does things to you. It makes your body feel heavy. It causes you not to think clearly. Uh, concise thought, much less memory, are not a part of what it is that you experience. And so as they're talking along the road, they're, in essence, trying to get the heaviness out and put it in front of them rather than bearing it privately within them. That's what talking through grief does. And that's what they are doing. And they're so lost in that world of shared grief and conversation. They don't even notice initially Jesus coming up, walking behind them, finally getting abreast of them. So as they are talking and entering into this conversation, Jesus actually has to break in and say, what, what are you talking about? And they look at him like he's a visitor from another planet. Are you the only one that did not know? And they tell the story of what it is that they know. But it's a, it is a story shaped by their own sense of loss. We had hoped that he would be the one to come and redeem Israel. You can hear the pathos of hope denied in the way it's described. So, and much more in a very telling comment. These women wrote, showed up and literally in the Greek it says, they drove us out of our senses. You see, what, do you, what kind of world do you live in? when in the midst of your own deep heaviness and internal grief, someone comes and says, in essence, it's not over. How do you even process the story of a man being raised from the dead? Of course they would dismiss it. There's nothing that in their experience that would have even begun to have prepared them. And so initially what Jesus does is listen. He's gentle. And the scripture even says their eyes were kept from seeing who he was. There's nothing in them that would have ever have been prepared in that moment anyway for a revelation of resurrection. So Jesus at that point is in fact their companion. A stranger traveling on the road. He's listening to their story. But the stranger in their eyes is paying very close attention to what it is that they are saying. And finally, when the air, as it were, is out, then, then Jesus speaks. And it's interesting, his response, because it's actually at the beginning a rebuke, not what you would have expected if Jesus had been a therapeutic counselor listening to a grief story. But he, at this point, feels the need to break in. You see, Jesus does that sometime. When our, our thoughts are so completely 
centered in our own experience so that we cannot see anything else but what it is that we are feeling in the moment. Jesus breaks in to show us a wider world, something much bigger than the, in essence, cycle, the internal cycle of replaying grief and loss and what we hope might have been but no longer can be. And so he uses strong words, slow of heart to believe, foolish, words that get their attention that in essence are almost like a caffeine injection into their lethargy. What? Who is this to speak to us in that manner? But Jesus doesn't stop there. He just keeps going. And I would have loved, as you too would have heard, wanted to have hear, heard his conversation. How does the Messiah teach them what the scriptures say about him? But that's what he began to do. He began to explain to them out of the scripture, which of course for them would have been Hebrew scripture, Old Testament, and how each of the things that had happened to Jesus had been prophesied thousands of years prior to these events actually happening. And something begins to happen inside of them as they listen to the things that Jesus is saying. What they would later say is, did our hearts not burn within us as we are walking along the road? Jesus' words do that. It's more than an impartation of information. information. That's how we think about words. We think about words to tell us things that we are supposed to know. But Jesus' words have a powerful authority in them that is far greater than the impartation of information. Something actually happens inside of us as we hear the word spoken. It's meant to create within us, in fact, a kind of sacramental impartation, a change in us that redirects how we think, that does more than for, inform, it enlightens. It opens our hearts to things that we never ever could have imagined without the change agent that Jesus' words are. And so when he begins to walk forward as if he's not going to stop for the night at the place where they are lodging, they want more of this. And they ask him to stay. And then in a wonderful turn of events, where they in essence have invited him to be their guest, when they sit at the table, the guest becomes the host. And he takes the bread breaks it, and they immediately recognize him as who he is. And they dash from that dinner table, in the dark of the evening, by the way, no small act, to go back to the eleven to tell them what it is that they have seen. It's in some ways a real description of Jesus' work in our lives. He is always at work helping us to try to see things from a perspective that is bigger than what it is that we know from our own experience, from what it is that we believe. And in fact, in a way that can occasionally even be shocking, there are these times when Jesus breaks through and shows us things that we never ever would have known otherwise. One author put it this way, if the God that you believe in always agrees with you, then you're probably not worshiping the God of the Bible. I always suspect that there are things about what I believe, even though I might hold them deeply, that may not actually accurately reflect the life and ministry of Jesus. There is this thing about Jesus that is meant to disturb and upend challenge our most deeply held assumptions. You see, the commitment that you and I have made as baptized Christians to be discipled is that that means all of our assumptions are on the table. He's not here to reaffirm our assumptions. He's actually here to upend them and speak words that at times are disturbing to break into those assumptions and form us in a new way as a disciple of Jesus, 
rather than merely a disciple of our own deeply held convictions. And so we walk with him as learners, as people who are humble enough to admit that it's not just that we don't have it all together or we haven't figured it out, that even some of our most deeply held convictions should be challenged. And out of that, we are always invited, often in a way that feels profoundly uncomfortable, into that childlike place of admitting that we don't know and that we need him to teach us. And it is in that moment as we learn that things do begin to change within our hearts and we begin to see him in an entirely new way, including the host at the Eucharistic banquet. But as the scripture teaches us, the end is not the meal. That's only true in the next life, when we gather together to feast in our heavenly home. But for now, the end is not the meal. The end is the mission. Sure, we recognize him as the host of the Eucharist, but in the end, we are commissioned. There are things that God wants us to say, that he has worked in us. And so what begins to happen as we look over the story is that we see that from the very beginning, what Jesus is doing with these two men along the road is to change their hearts, to allow them to see him as he is, and then to go and tell. That's the cycle. Jesus meeting us where we are, listening patiently to all of our thinking, even if it's just wrong, to work in us a new capacity to receive the things that we did not know, to correct our assumptions, and to draw us closer to him, creating new hunger just to be with him and to learn from him, and finally gather with him at a meal that eventually releases us into a place of mission. Open our eyes to see your hand at work, we prayed at the collect. What is God doing? What is God doing in you and in me as his children? That's what he's doing. He's listening. He's teaching. He's changing. He's feeding. He's commissioning. And that's a cycle that is repeated again and again and again. Oh Lord, help us to be available for what it is that you are doing, to make room in our hearts to be loved and to be challenged. Awaken us from the lethargy of our grief that we might see a bigger world where you are at work and hear your invitation to adore you and be a part of what it is that you are doing. For that's where true joys are to be found. Amen. I hope you enjoyed that message from the bishop and that through our readings today, you, you saw the theme that God wants a change in our lives, that he wants to give us the confidence to speak with truth, that he wants us to accept him and to follow his ways, to love him, to love each other, that when we do that, there are rewards that are greater, more precious than silver, more precious than gold, more precious than diamonds. I hope that you find a change in your life this week. God is calling you, Jesus is calling you. He wants you to accept his will in your life, to find a change in perspective, that will transcend what we think is important and we'll be able to see the truth. I hope you are blessed this week. I hope you are blessed through our liturgy of the word. And I hope to see you next week. Until then, may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Praise God.
Thank you once again for joining us this morning. One of the blessings we have here is our preschool, and typically this time of year we would have Preschool Sunday where we would invite all the students and families and the teachers to a worship service to be able to honor the work that they've done. Well, I'd like to invite you next week to join us as we do a virtual Preschool Sunday. I hope to see you then.